Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the first of three videos in a new iOS 16 series on the new navigation API in iOS 16. In this video, I'll introduce you to the navigation stack. We'll take a look at this new container view along with its components, namely the navigation link, the navigation destination method, and a navigation path. In the second video of this series, we'll stay with the navigation stack and look more into programmable navigation using deep links from external sources to open and navigate to views within your app. And then in the third video in this series, we'll look at the new navigation split view container that will allow us to present two and three column navigation views on larger devices while still falling back to a traditional navigation stack on narrower ones. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. I have a starter project for this video, and I encourage you to work along with me so that when completed, you'll have an application with some reference code and examples that you can refer back to when you start to implement a navigation stack in your own projects. This project has a tab view so that you can install this on your phone or run it in the simulator and access both of these views which we'll be working on. During this tutorial, however, I'll be showing you everything in the preview and we won't be running in the simulator. The first tab has a list view inside using the old navigation view and it is fully functional. It even has a button that will push another view onto the navigation stack. The second tab is currently empty, and we'll be adding code shortly. Let's check that code for the first tab. In SwiftUI prior to iOS 16, navigation was a real problem for a lot of people. It became even more evident if you wanted to navigate to another view from a button. Let's refresh your memory on how bad things were by looking at this first example of how we used to have to do things. In fact, if we option click on the navigation view and bring up the documentation, we'll see that navigation view is now deprecated. So we're going to have to make some changes. The navigation link is okay, as we see with this first navigation link. The second one, however, is now deprecated. And thank goodness, because every time I had to implement it, meaning I had to push a view from a button, I had to look up how to do it. And thank you, Paul Hudson, for hacking with Swift. The other issue is if you're going to run this on an iPad. If I change my device to an iPad now, you see that we're in a split view mode. And to get to the navigation view, I have to tap this button to get to it. Prior to iOS 16, in order to fix that, we had to apply a navigation view style of a type that is a stack and add that as a modifier to our navigation view container. So what I want to do right now is to update this code so that there will be no warnings and it'll be compatible with iOS 16. So first, let me comment out this deprecated navigation link here because I can't use that ever. And this means that we no longer need this state property here. So let's remove it. And without it, we'll need to remove the action on that button. We'll be replacing this using the new iOS 16 API in a minute. Let's remove this navigation view style modifier because we'll no longer need that at all. And why will we no longer need it? Because we're going to change this navigation view container to a navigation stack. And this essentially does the same thing as adding the navigation view style modifier. If we want to have a split view, we'll need to use a navigation split view container, and that's what we're going to go over in the third video of this series. As you can see, the navigation link with destination overload still works in the list case. So you can continue to use that. It's not yet deprecated. However, there is a new overload that will allow us to use it in both cases. So let's forget about this overload from now on and use the new one. So let me comment out this code for now. 
When I type navigation link, I see that I have four options available to me. This is similar to when we create buttons. There is a simple version where we can use a string or localized string for the title, or a generic view if we want our label to have more information. We see the two destination options here for views that we used in iOS 15, and the two now with the value option. Since we use the old title key destination for our previous link, let's use the title key value option for this new link. What's most interesting to us is the value now. The value is some value that optionally is both codable, meaning encodable and decodable, and hashable. Now, codable is something you should really be familiar with, and a common task for iOS apps is to save data and send it over the network. But before you do that, you need to convert the data to a suitable format through a process called encoding or serialization. And when you receive data, in order to work with it, you need to decode it. So the object has to be decodable. If an object can be encoded and decoded, it's also known as being codable, as codable is just an alias for both of these two protocols together. In Swift, hashable is a protocol that provides a hash value to our object. And a hash value is used to compare two instances. To use the hash value, we first have to conform or associate the type to the hashable protocol. And many types in Swift standard library already conform to the hashable protocol. And these include string, int, boolean, and double. Paul Hudson from Hacking with Swift has a nice post on how to conform to the hashable protocol if your object doesn't do this already. To use the new navigation link type then, the link that you're tapping on to perform the navigation must be codable and hashable. And that item in our case is our fruit, which happens to be a string, and a string is both hashable and codable. So we're okay, we don't need to do anything else. So we then can replace the old navigation link with simply this. The value is this iterated instance of our items array of string, which is our fruit emoji. I can remove that commented out code now. Now the problem is that we no longer are providing a destination. So when we click on this navigation link, where does it go? Well, in iOS 16, we now have a new method that we can attach to our view that's called the navigation destination method and it is for a type, and a destination view must be provided. So the navigation destination is the new method added to SwiftUI, which returns the destination view based on the data type of the value in the navigation link when the navigation link is tapped. It's handled by the provided navigation destination method, which in turn returns the view. This method has to be applied to a view inside the navigation stack and not on the navigation stack itself. Ideally, to help you read your code better, it should be attached to the view where your link is, but be careful not to attach it inside a repeating loop like a for each or a list. Attach it to the loop construct itself. So that's why we've added ours to the list. The navigation is for a type. And what is that type? It's for our emoji item, which is a string type. So we'll need to identify the type by adding self. Now, if we hit enter on the trailing closure, we get an instance of that hashable type. And in our case, we know that it's a string representing our fruit. So let's just call it that. The body then is our view that we want to display. And I have this chosen view here at the bottom of this file that requires a fruit when instantiated, and that is the fruit that we're going to pass into this view. So let's review. In our navigation link, we provide either a string or a view for the label, and we provide a hashable, codable instance of some object, which in our case is a fruit, 
an actual apple or orange, etc. Then we must provide the destination for whatever the type was that our instance was. So in our case, it was a string type, so we added self. And then we provided the destination view, and this method closure provides us with the actual instance that was tapped on, and that's what we can pass into our view to generate our destination view. As you can see, our navigation is working using the new navigation and destination method. Now, since this method is not actually part of our navigation link, we can use it for any navigation link value that is a string. Now, this button does nothing here. All it did was toggle the Boolean property that we have removed. So I'm going to create a navigation link here instead. But I want to use the same string for the link, so I'll copy it before I delete this button and its style modifier for now. What I want to do is to replace the button with a simple navigation link, where the title key is the same as what we used for our button. For the value, I'll use the same one that I had previously used, and that was the eighth item in our items array. So it's items at index 7. As you can see, we now get our navigation by tapping on that link, as before. Well, navigation links can be stylized the same way that you stylize buttons. So we can simply add a button style to a navigation link as we would for a regular button. So I'm going to use a bordered prominent style. It works because we have a navigation destination method that says that whenever we tap on a navigation link where the value is some type of string, it will pass that string on and present our navigation view. This is the key because our destination is no longer tied to a specific link in the list. It's associated with a link that provides a string type. For example then, let's embed this navigation link in an H stack. And then for the second link, let's use an alternate overload for creating a navigation link with a value and a label. For the label closure, I'll just use a text view with the string other. The value then, if I want to use this for the destination method, can be any string. So I don't need to use one of my fruit. Why don't I just use a smiling face emoji? Well, what about the navigation destination now though? Well, our value is a string, and we already have a navigation destination method for a string type, and that's currently attached to our list view. That doesn't matter, so long as the method is attached to a view within the navigation stack. When we test now, we see that it works because that emoji is a string, and that destination method will be applied to every link where that type is a string. The placement of the navigation destination method, if it bothers you, can always be moved to a better location. So for example, I'm going to move this outside of the V stack entirely, so that now it's clear that this applies to both of the navigation links above it. And this hashable instance variable fruit is just that, a variable, and so long as our navigation link value is a string, it'll get passed on. So perhaps a better choice for a name for this hashable value here should be closer to what it represents. So let me change that to a string value. Before we move on to a more practical example, let's explore the navigation link some more and how it relates to both the navigation destination method and the navigation stack itself, just so that you get a really good understanding. In the intro true view, or the second tab, I already set up a navigation stack along with providing you with a sample object called author that has three properties, a name, a string, numbooks, which is an int, and color, which is associated to the author. And I just made that color up. There's no connection with the author. I've also provided a static property called sample. That's an array of these authored instances that we can use in our example. Let's have a little fun by adding four navigation links within that V stack. I want to add a navigation link for each of the three different properties, and each one is a different type, and then a fourth one for the whole object itself. Let's just start as we did before using the navigation link where we have a title key and a value. And for the first one, I'm going to use the name property of our 
author sample zero name for our label. And then for the value, I'm going to use the same thing, the author dot sample zero dot name. Now I can repeat this then for the other two properties, but I'll pick a different object, meaning a different one from the array, and a different property for the value, but I'll keep the object's name as the label. So for the second one, it'll be sample one, the value is going to be our num books. For the third, we'll use example two, and the value is going to be color. And then for the third, we're going to use the entire author itself, author sample three as our value. We're getting an error here that says that our author needs to conform to the hashable protocol. Well, fortunately for us, since all three properties are hashable, author is hashable by default as well, but we do have to specify that it does conform to the hashable protocol. So let's do that. So far, so good, but let's also add a bordered button style to all of these so we can do that itself on the stack. Now we'll need to create a navigation destination method for each of these four different types and provide some view to present. So I'm gonna attach this method to the vStack just after the navigation title. Now the first one will be the string type. So we'll have to make sure that we use self and we'll just display a text view with the string value and we'll set it to a large title. So we can duplicate this method and just change things for the remaining three types. So for the second, the type is an int, so int.self. And then for the destination, I'll use a text view again, but use string interpolation to display the number of books written by that author. In the third case, the type is a color, and the color value we get is a view. So we can just use that view itself as our destination as well. And we're not getting any complaints, so color itself must be both encodable and hashable. Finally, then we get the full author object. I get an author value that's an instance with all of the properties. So the destination is going to be a Z stack where I'm going to set the background to a color using the author values color property. And then I can create a V stack to display the name followed by the number of books. And we can apply a large title here as well. When we test this now, we're directed to the correct view in each case. Let's add another link to try and display a random author though. I already have the destination method for the author type, so all I will need is a link. So let me choose a random item from the sample, and I'm going to have to unwrap it. When I try to add a navigation link to display a random author, we always get the same author because this view isn't being updated after each tap. The first time the view is laid out, the random element is selected, and no matter how many times I tap this link, it won't change. And this is where the power comes in for this new navigation method. Behind the scenes in the new navigation API, a path is maintained, and each time that you push a new view onto the stack, it adds that path to that set. And when you return from the view, it removes it. So right now, my path is empty. What I can do is to create a property for that path so that I can manage it. And since we are trying to navigate to a view based on our author objects, I'm going to create a state property called path that is initially an empty array of these objects. Now I'm going to change that navigation link to just be a button of the same name using that same string as the label. And then for the action, I can create a random author. And once I have that random author, I can append it to the path. 
But before this can work, we need to do one more thing. We need to bind this navigation stack to the path as an argument, kind of like a selection made on a tab view or on a list. When we now tap on this button, it gets a random book and appends it to the path, which in turn pushes the new view onto the stack, which happens to be the one specified in the navigation link method. So we get a different view presented each time we tap on the button. And this Jane Austen link still works too, because it is an author associated type. The other links don't work though. And the reason is that we've defined our path as a homogeneous type in that it's always expecting an author. We can change the path to say an array of string, for example. And let me temporarily comment out this append here because it won't work anymore. Now, the first link works because that link is expecting a string, but none of the others work now. Similarly, if I change the path to an array of int, only the second navigation link works. So the answer then is to turn this path into a heterogeneous set of objects. And to do that, we can define it as an instance of a navigation path. This will allow us to add any object to our path. I can uncomment this append code now, and as we test, we'll see that all of our links are now working. Now, I hope this has given you a good understanding of how navigation stack, navigation link, navigation destinations, and navigation paths all work together. In the second video on Navigation Stack, I'm going to be looking at a more specific example that goes deeper than one level into a Navigation Stack and see how we can also implement a pop to root button on the deepest view, as well as how we can implement deep links whereby you can force your app to open to a specific view based on a link coming from an external source. Links to all of the Navigation videos are in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to get notifications of future videos as soon as I release them. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in future videos.